Hello everyone and welcome to this special edition of the new Fly Fisher. We're looking back at some of the incredible lodges and guides in Eastern Idaho, Yellowstone Teton Territory. This is going to be fun. This big fish adventure starts right now on the new Fly Fisher. Ooh, that's a nice sized fish. Absolutely fantastic. That is what you're in for on this episode of the new Fly Fisher. The new Fly Fisher is supported by Visit Idaho, Yellowstone Teton Territory, Orvis Fly Fishing, Scientific Anglers, Trout Unlimited, WeatherTech Canada. The Rocky Mountains span from the far north of Western Canada to New Mexico in the Southern USA. 3,000 miles of rugged beauty. The Rockies also make up a major part of the state of Idaho. In Eastern Idaho, as with the rest of the state, they are revered for their beauty, their majesty, the recreational adventures they afford, and of course, the fishing opportunities in both foothills and at elevation be they small spring creeks, large rivers, reservoirs, or high alpine lakes, Yellowstone Teton Territory is an angler's mecca for multi-species in a variety of settings. We're in Victor, Idaho, making Teton Valley Resort our home away from home on this high alpine adventure. Teton Valley Resort, located in Victor, Idaho, is an adventurer's dream home base for all seasons. Multiple private cabins play host to couples or larger groups and are very well appointed with excellent Wi-Fi. All the amenities of home and incredible access to all things Idaho. Full kitchens, linens, gas fireplaces, and smart TVs. You don't miss any comfort of home. Outside, guests find a hot tub, heated pool, pickleball courts, and an on-site bistro. Perfect for anglers, travelers, RVers, and glampers. Teton Valley Resort prides itself on excellence on every level. This little alpine lake is literally no bigger than a basketball court. With inflow and outflow, the fish can, in high water events, travel from the top lake to the bottom. It must be both deep and have some sort of spring upwell, or it would definitely freeze in the winter. And if you can believe it, this little lake holds giant fish. We came down to this little lake, tiny little lake. And uh, I mean, look at the size of it. It's an acre big and it's got cutthroat that have come down from the upper lake. And uh, there was a giant that swam under that tree. Uh, I was trying to get him out, but this little guy came and ate it. I'm not complaining, I'll take it all day long. Nice. Right over here in the water. Let's just see. This is so much fun. Can't believe it. High mountain hunting. Look at this awesome little cutthroat. Bait the hopper. Look at that. Just ideal. This is great. So that fish came from the structure on the right of the pond. Another little guy. I know there's gotta be big ones in here. But that's fine. This is 
fun, fun. He struck it, not like a cutthroat either. He came and just whacked it. So I'll show you the fly I'm using. Let's let this guy go. Just gently. So a little tiny green bottom, yellow bottom hopper. Nice little fly. Um, you know, floats high and uh, little twitches. The legs go crazy. It's got little rubber legs on it. Legs are back and forth and driving these fish nuts. Crab. So I just tied on a uh, the rig, the subsurface rig that I had on back up top, and uh, <laughs> I've got two cutties on at once. First time in my career that's happened. What do you know? It's the most unbelievable. One took the renegade, the other one took the mighty mouse. It's unreal. Look how red those cheeks are. Oh my gosh. Oh, what a show. Got them both. I'll tell you what, this has never happened to me before. I've had bass on a double rig, but one's always come off. Never two cutthroat at once. Come on in, take a look. There, that one is, look at that. You think that one's colorful? Wait for the next one. And those two fish, along with the long grass, gave me one heck of a tangled line. I had my fly about 20 feet off the shore as I tried to untangle myself. Oh, got one. <laughs> That's a good fish. So I was just undoing a tangle and uh, I had this thing, my rig dead, dead sticked in the water and uh, moved it, lifted it up out of the dirt. Oh, where's my net? Oh, that's a good fish. And this guy picked it up as soon as this streamer came out of the mud and he was there. So you go from a unique fishery, a unique catch, and a double to a unique fish. Wow, what a good fish. Look at the size of this pond and the size of this trout. Better to be lucky than good. You are not going to believe the size of the cutthroat trout that has come out of this tiny, tiny little pond. If you want to ever think about coming to Idaho and catching high mountain cutthroat in small alpine lakes, what do you think of that? <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, the tag, 2192215. One of the cool things about this fish 
is that it's part of the Fish and Game tagging program. So I'm gonna record the tag, call it into Fish and Game, and it'll give them information on when it was originally tagged, how many times it's been caught, and where it's been caught. Great program. All right, let's unbutton this guy and let him go. So the equipment used on this high alpine adventure fishing for cutthroat trout in Yellowstone Teton territory is as follows. It's really quite simple. Four weights and five weights, nine foot fly rods with fast action so you can get those flies out into the lake. The reel is nothing more than a small to mid arbor reel, a vessel to hold your line. These fish are not going to take you into your backing, they're not going to run very far. Lines are matching four and five weight, weight forward floating lines and the leaders were nine to 12 foot 4X and 5X tapered leaders with matching 4X and 5X tippet. For flies, we used a variety of small streamers, including the Mighty Mouse and the Half-Ass Renegade, Flashback Pheasant Tail Nymphs, and of course, Quill Droppers. And don't forget your bear spray. That's really all you need for fishing these high mountain lakes for cutthroat trout here in Yellowstone Teton territory. Welcome to the Teton River in the heart of Yellowstone Teton Territory. The Teton River is a tributary of the legendary Henry's Fork of the Snake River. Spanning 64 miles, it winds its way through the Teton Valley and is the lifeblood for agriculture, recreation, and of course, incredible fly fishing. On the banks of the Teton River is Teton Valley Lodge, a fly fisher's dream destination with access to multiple fisheries including the Henry's Fork, South Fork of the Snake, and the Teton River itself, Teton Valley Lodge has you covered for a lifetime of adventure on the water. In eastern Idaho, you can float, walk and wade, and even rappel into some of the finest trout fishing in the west. With expert guides to assist in every step of the way, Teton Valley Lodge has it dialed in for any angler looking for world-class fly fishing. Teton Valley Lodge is a full-service lodge located just outside of Driggs, Idaho. The lodge doesn't leave any amenity left behind. Delicious meals, private cabins, full dining room, and fly shop ensure you're all set and ready for your fly fishing adventure. To my right, Chris Scott. To my left is the world famous Teton River. Chris has been guiding here for more than 20 years. Chris, what's the plan for the day? Well, Mark, uh, this is a pretty special deal to what we're doing today. We're head hunting for big trout on flat water. Situation where we're gonna see them feed, sneak in there, lay a fly in there, watch them take it. It's pretty awesome stuff. If you've never head hunted in Idaho, you're really missing out. Go. And not only is this style of fishing special, the technique and the boat used to fish out of is entirely unique as well. Yeah, these boats are really special. They're from Michigan originally, and the guys that pioneered this stuff are the guys that originally started the lodge. And uh, we're just carrying on that tradition. It's a pretty special deal because we can get in there really sneaky and slick and quiet and get right on these big spooky fish without them knowing we're here. So am I making long casts? Yeah, we're making pretty long casts. Uh, the surface is really glassy and they can see us just as well as we can see them. That's why we fish sitting down. Um, basically, as you're looking down the river, sitting here, the point where you can no longer see under the surface well is about how far we're gonna need to cast to them. Okay. Right, because if you can see the bottom well, then they can see you coming at them. And we're fishing straight down to them. So we've got that bigger parachute dry fly on there that's gonna land on the surface really softly. So that means we can set it a lot closer to the fish without spooking them, if that makes sense. As we're casting on an individual fish, we'll lay it in there, trying to anticipate which way he's going. If the fly comes by him and he obviously didn't see it or refuse it or eat it, 
then you'll want to strip it back up so it comes back up around him. For some reason, that doesn't spook him. If you pull it off the water and just try and cast, that'll spook him. But if you strip it back up next to him along the film in the surface before you recast, so you get the flies on our back to our side of him, that usually doesn't spook him, and you can just reset and make another presentation on him. Gotcha. Oh, just leave it, stand by. Remember to let him eat it. Give him a second. Leave it, leave it, leave it. Take him. Yeah! Man, is that ever fun. Are you kidding me? Keep your rod tip up. Good job. He looked at it and then turned around and came back on it again. Two feet of water, man. Two feet of water. You're right, they do try to get down in the grass, don't they? You got him. Nice work. He took the emerger. Yeah, nice cut bow. Cool. Just lift him right up there. Got him. Oh, he's a pure cutthroat. Pure one. Nice. There we go. Ate my new emerger. Yeah, put him down on the water. You see these little clear spots on the bottom where you can see clear gravel. Those are some of the only spots through here that fish can sit in one spot and feed. So when I can find one that's in a spot like that, I can pretty much guarantee that when our flies get there, he's still gonna be there, you know, which helps us out a lot. Otherwise, they're moving around a lot and you really gotta get a cast that's close to them in order to get them to eat. Otherwise, your fly will just go through there and, and they just happen to be off to one side or the other eating something else. It's nothing you're doing wrong, it's just a rhythm thing. So this is a really interesting fishery here whereby each of these fish has his own attitude and his own personality. And so as we go from one feeder to the next hunt, hunting them, we get to watch each individual and decide what they're doing, how they're working, if they're happy or sad or agitated or otherwise, and then make adjustments accordingly. It's pretty fun. Every, every minute's different, every fish is different. It changes hourly and we get to change with it. It's pretty fun stuff. That's a good fish, that's a happy fish. Nice, nice. Ooh, might have been a hair close to him that time. Just let it go and see. See how his his mannerism and body language changed right as the flies landed. Yeah. He moved a lot more water. Take him. Yeah. Strip, strip, strip. Yeah. That's a big fish, man. We watched this fish from yards up. Beauty. Feeding and getting happy. That's a beauty. And I thought I screwed up the cast by putting the fly too close to this. Oh my gosh, what a gorgeous cutthroat. Look at that thing. Trophy cutthroat on the Teton River. Look at that. Oh, That's a big yeah. fish, man. Here we go. Big wild cutthroat. Great job, Mark. Well, you made some improvements to your cast and got the flies turned over perfectly. I'll tell you, well, we, we laid it in a little too close to him there at first and he spooked for a second. I thought he wasn't gonna come and grab it, but you did a good job to leave it there and let him come and take it. Great job. In the heart of eastern Idaho, Yellowstone Teton Territory, sits the small potato town of Ashton. Ashton is the closest town to the hamlet of Warm River. The Warm River runs Freestone as a tributary of the legendary Henry's Fork of the Snake River and plays host to the historically significant Three Rivers Ranch. If you're looking for a secluded fly fishing getaway, look no further than Three Rivers Ranch. After all, Warm River has a recent permanent resident population of just three people. The Three Rivers Ranch story seems to begin in the early 1930s. However, the first homestead constructed in the property was at the turn of the century. The business was created to offer provisions to train tourists heading into Yellowstone Park. Then the only way into the park was by train through Warm River. 
As people traveled to experience the park then, today we are on our way to experience the legendary fishing Yellowstone Teton territory has to offer. Our host at Three Rivers Ranch is fourth generation Warm Riverite and entrepreneur Bonnie Allen. Three Rivers Ranch in Warm River, Idaho is a staple for fly anglers in the Yellowstone Teton Territory. Seven private luxury cabins expertly furnished leave no amenity unthought of, and they are all nestled along a private stretch of Robinson's Creek. The historic main lodge allows you to step back in time to experience the ranch's storied past. Chef Karen Roberts, a 40-year staple of Three Rivers, ensures you're well looked after at the lodge and on the water. Three Rivers Ranch is home away from home for anglers to realize their fly fishing dreams in one of Idaho's true jewels, Yellowstone Teton Territory. We head to the middle of the Henry's Fork in search of brown trout. The weather is starting to turn for the worse. With a cold front moving in quickly, it's perfect for throwing streamers for pre-spawn browns. Good. Because she came out from underneath that tree, didn't she? Yep, she sure did. Good one. Came out of that little hole in there. Nice. All right. Look at the weather out here. Look at how snotty it is. It's blowing 40. It's cold. It's cloudy. Perfect brown trout weather. Yeah, with this front coming in, it's blowing these clouds in. It's got these big fish on the prow to hunt. That real bright, sunny weather you know, that we had earlier today is gone. So um, perfect time in the evening, that witching hour, and uh, just cloud cover. Couldn't ask for better uh, brown trout, you know, streamer weather. So uh, hopefully they just keep keeping it up. Did you touch it? Nope. So when you cast it out there, mend it before you strip it. Up or down? Up. By the time to sink a bit. Well, that and it gets it there straight it on. Yeah. There's a good fish. Great tip, BJ. Thank you. Yep. Oh, yeah. Now, I really appreciate what BJ is doing right now because he's actually keeping me at a distance where I'm capable of casting in this nasty wind away from the bank. So I don't have a lot of line out um, that I have to deal with and negotiate. This is a great brown. So in keeping that out there, I can place the cast. I don't have to worry too much about line management. Um, and then on this last cast, he said, you know what, just give it a little mend up and see what see what you can do. Oh, nice man. fish. Look at that. Woohoo! What a fish, BJ. Oh my gosh. Look at the blue on his cheek. Yeah. It's not even teal, it's blue. <laughs> He's looking at me. He is. <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic brown. So the reason you caught that fish mark was that when as soon as you casted it out there, you gave it an upriver men, which caused that fit that streamer to come parallel to you and swim cross current instead of flying down river which is like a like a baseball player trying to hit a 90 mile per hour uh fastball which is very difficult so instead of them coming and chasing it and waiting for that to finally swing which then makes it vulnerable you know prey that's when they'll eat it but if we're focusing on that water on the bank we want that to not be coming down the bank and coming finishing here close to the boat. We would rather have it kind of come parallel or upriver so it kind of ticks and then straightens out as the current catches it. That's the prime time for them to eat it as prey. When it starts to swing downriver at the boat, that's fine because we're kind of over that anyways. So good work, good job. There he is. Nice. Oh, did you see that boil? Saw the boil and watched the eat. You ready? Take your time. Take your time. These fish are tough. It's all right. Just be easy. And that's 2x. I mean, I've had fish in here blow up zero. Okay. 
Come on, darling. Every bit of this six weight put to work. Saw the boil. Yes! <laughs> Look at that. Unbelievable. Man, this is turning out to be an absolutely unbelievable evening here on the Henry's Fork. Fish. Oh, another good brown. Are you kidding me? Get him on the reel. He's going uptown. Oh, it's a rainbow. Yeah. Sweet. Head up, slide, 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 back, 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 back. There you go. All right. Good job. Look at the colors on that. It's lit right up. Just like that rainbow. Yep. Welcome to the lodge at Palisades Creek in the small village of Irwin in eastern Idaho. The lodge is in Yellowstone Teton territory and is located just off Highway 26 on a sprawling 22-acre property. It's perfectly situated with ample waterfront access to the world-famous South Fork of the Snake River. We're here late season for the unreal terrestrial fishing the snake is known for. Throwing hoppers and mutant stoneflies for big fish looking to prepare themselves for the winter season. It's mid-September, and while most anglers have put their rods away in pursuit of game on terra firma, we've arrived to experience fishing big flies to big brown trout, rainbow trout, cut bows, and cutthroat trout. Up first, we're with lodge manager and longtime guide with the snake, Justin Hayes. What separates maybe the lodge from other places and other lodges here on the South Fork is our ability to fish for cutthroat trout. Rainbow trout are in all 50 states now, I think except Florida, so all 49 states. The lodge is located on the bank of the South Fork of the Snake River, yeah, right on the Idaho-Wyoming border in eastern Idaho. We're 22 acres, there's 13 guest cabins here. We accommodate up to 26 people comfortably. We're a family-owned business. Maybe that's part of what our guests feel when they come here. We're allowed to make our own decisions here, create the experience for our guests. We're able to communicate with them personally every day. That's what we do here. We try to take people fishing. We try to make them strong drinks, clean beds, <laughs> and uh, good food. Hey Mark, I'm gonna show you a little trick here that might help us with the sets and whatnot here in a little bit. Yep. Um, so we have two different types of movements with the bugs. We have a grasshopper, which kicks, kicks. We also have a stonefly, which skitters. Da -da 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 -da. The key to this skitter is making a V wake and stripping long while you're jiggling the rod. Okay. And you wanna be a little tighter to the fly than say you normally would on say nymph, nymph fishing say. And so we're not looking for the big, like a wavelengths of line and the slackiness because it doesn't get tight until there, right? Yeah. What we're gonna do, because some of these fish will be quick, we're gonna get down and tighter with less wavelengths of line and a little tighter to the bug um, so that we have more of a connection when that fish eats it. Gotcha. Now, do you find in those back eddies these fish will come and hit it right away or do you, do you generally throw a couple casts up there in hopes that you might lure one out? Uh, you know what I say, Mark? I say there's no usually, normally, generally right. fishing. Good. Because I think every time different. One day I'll come down and they'll be piled in this little spot or this and that. Come down the next day, nothing happens. All right, take them. That was awesome. Good That's job, Mark. On cue. Yeah. Right at the base of the structure, right? Yep. We're always looking for an eat as the, as the, as the current leaves the structure. That's right. That is the structure, is, is the current leaving the structure, if you know what I'm saying. It's an ambush point. Yes, sir. Nice fish. That is a nice fish. Hybrid. That was good timing, everything was great. Good way to start the day, man. Dry fly. Here you go. Can't complain about that. You wanna kiss him, Mark? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> uh, take him. Good. You know what? I always love it when they run to the middle of the river. <laughs> oh, you got a nice save, Mark. That's a tarpon move. Good job. They run, the big fish tend to do that, don't they? 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 As soon as they get hooked, they yep. run to the middle of the river. Yep. 
I'm gonna kind of come with you. You let me know what you need, or I can row away, or you tell me what you need. I got him. Okay. That's a nice fish, Mark. Nice brown trout. Yep. We'll get pictures of this guy for sure. And you were just saying, you know, subtle eat, right? Yep. Total I mean, that, that subtle thing eat. That, I, to me, it looked like a tiny fish. You know what I'm saying? All I saw was the beak. Nice. Wow, Mark. That's a long fish. Great fish. Man. Look at that, Mark. Beauty. I love the blues. Yeah. The Yellowstone Teton region offers numerous accommodation options. However, when fishing Henry's Lake, it's tough to beat accommodations such as Jared's Wild Rose Ranch Resort, where the lakeshore is just a short walk away and you can moor your boat so it's ready to go whenever you want to hit the water. So the Wild Rose dates back to the mid 1800s. Uh, got the property then and uh, it's been around since then. Uh, the old, a lot of the old buildings are not here anymore, but some of the old cabins right behind me are. Um, but uh, we, uh, my dad got involved with this in the uh, mid 80s. And then we, me and my wife, I just got married in 96, and that's when we came up and uh, started running it for my dad. And then about 10 years ago, we started buying it and have been running it still ever since. So our accommodations are varied. We have uh, cabins, rooms, condos, uh, small units and big units. They'll range from two people to, we've got a 10 bed, 20 person unit. So we've got a large variety of sizes and, and shapes and, um, and that uh, is good for certain types of groups like reunions, but it also provides different families the option to stay here on the lake and, and as well as we have RVs and campsites. So we've got, uh, we've got a little mini store in the lodge. We've got uh, a restaurant, hot tub. Uh, we've got a marina on the lake. Uh, and on the lake, there's boat rentals. There's, uh, uh, you know, people can launch their boats. Obviously, it's a world-class fishing lake. This is a fisherman's paradise with uh, the Madison and the Gallatin being on one side and then all the the Idaho rivers, the Henry's Fork, and the, the outlet, and of course, fishing right on Henry's Lake. Uh, yeah, there's just fishing galore in this area. We are fishing Henry's in early fall. Water temperatures are warmer than last time. The lake is on the tail end of its annual summer algae bloom, but Henry's Lake trout should still be feeding as they switch into their annual fall feeding mode. One of the reasons Henry's is one of my favorite still waters to fish anywhere is it's so shallow. I believe the deepest spot when the lake's at full pool, maybe 18 feet. The rest of the lake is super shallow. So what does that mean? Well, it's a giant shoal. A shoal is any portion of the lake bottom that is actually, that sunlight actually hits. And what this does is it stimulates plant growth through photosynthesis, and of course provides great habitat for all the food sources these Henry's Lake hybrids, brookies, and cuts feed on. Henry's Lake, beautiful place to be. The scenery is spectacular, and this mother nature made one fantastic stillwater fishery. Bill, let's go through uh, the setups that we have here fishing Henry's Lake. Sure, it's full. So we're gonna be spending a lot of the time fishing the shallows, probably less than 10 feet deep, even shallower, hopefully, that would be fun. So the first order of business is a floating line setup with a floating line designed for casting strike indicators. Indicator setups, excellent way to start the day when fish seem a bit slow and not willing to chase. Just hang something down there, a foot or two off the bottom like a leech, bounce leech, and a perfect way to go. Yeah, so I've got the same rig for um, for my bobber rig, um, but instead of Phil's six weight finesse rod, I'm using a five weight fly rod, nine foot, uh, with a f with a floating line, and I've got a straight shot of one X liter uh, material that uh, goes right to a balanced bruise leech for me. 
And then the next order would be something in the slow sinking line category. Um, this is uh, like yours, a five weight, a 10 footer. Uh, 10 foot rods are excellent for still waters, extend your reach. Um, this is a clear intermediate, so something that sinks anywhere from a hover at about one inch per second to clear intermediates about an inch and a half per second, stripping leeches, uh, small scuds, minnow patterns, those kind of things. So that's more of a finesse technique for what you're doing. Yeah. And then what I'm doing is I'm throwing the, the you know the kitchen sink at these guys. This is a six weight, uh, and I've got a type seven sink tip on this, which means it sinks at seven inches per second. So I'm counting down 10 to 15 seconds on my casts, and then I'm retrieving the 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 strip into. And the fish are going to tell me what they're looking for—a fast trip, a slow crawl, a crawl kind of thing. Um, and then I've got a uh, brown bead-headed leech here, followed by by a nymph. Yeah. And lastly, uh, for fishing a little deeper and just covering through the water, this is a parabolic line. This line has three sink rates along its length. This has a a front section that sinks at three inches per second, a mid section that sinks at five inches per second, and then the back section sinks at three inches per second. So what this does is, is gets the line to sweep through the water like so, and I've got maybe about a seven foot leader set up with a buoyant fly on the point, a booby, um, and in between that and the fly line, I've got a little minnow pattern, it could be a leech. The trick with this line is you want to be able to cast it as far as you can so you get all those three differing sink rates working to your advantage. It's an English technique called the washing line because the fly, the buoyant fly in conjunction with your line, helps support those middle droppers uh, like clothes on a washing line. Getting the fly where the fish are and letting them find it. They are hungry and they will eat. As there are little to no hatches during the fall season, our fly selection focused on bread and butter food sources such as leeches, bait fish, along with attractors. Some of our best producing patterns included the humongous, olive pumpkin balanced leeches, micro leeches, scuds such as the soft tackle scud, various colored woolly buggers, and attractors such as boobies and fabs. All right, so I'm fishing a clear intermediate. This line sinks at about one and a half inches per second. We're working shallow water here. So what I'm doing is I'm making my cast as long as I can to cover as much water as I can. And I'm mentally counting down about 15 seconds, almost three feet. And then rod tip is right in the water. Start off with two quick strips. That makes sure I'm tight, there's no slack in there. A pause, a couple of quick strips maybe. Long, slow pull tip is right in the water. So if I get a strike, I'm just going to strip like this and pull that fly right into the corner of their mouth. Just fishing the single fly because we're pretty shallow with a fair amount of weed growth, little pockets, and sometimes that second fly, when you hook a fish, becomes a liability because it's going to hook weeds and could cause you to lose a fish. So, oh, energetic. There he is. Not the largest Henry's Lake fish, but. Got lots of growth left in him. This productive environment in which he lives, or she lives. Lots of food here to eat. Tons of scuds, damsels, leeches, baitfish, zooplankton, mayfly nymphs, calabatus. There we go. I'll put him in the net. Drift Lodge and Fly Shop is located right on Idaho's artery to access for anglers, the famous Highway 20, just a few short miles from the Montana border and the west gate of Yellowstone National Park. The lodge has a variety of extremely economical lodging options to choose from, including a large house for bigger groups to smaller cabins perfect for couples or you and your fishing buddy. Regardless, whatever suits your style, all cabins are extremely comfortable with Wi-Fi, full kitchens, full power, and satellite television should you want. 
The lodge is a housekeeping lodge, so you can come and go at your leisure and eat when you like. Today, we're splitting our day between Yellowstone National Park and a drive-to access of the Henry's Fork. We start on the Henry's Fork, and I try a relatively new technique to me, tight line nymphing. One of the things that I absolutely love about fishing in Yellowstone Teton territory, specifically the Island Park region, is the fact that there are so many rivers and creeks where you can do it yourself, DIY. All you have to do is drop into a fly shop, pick up some flies, ask the right questions, and they can help you and guide you to rivers like this. This is a section of the Henry's Fork that we're gonna fish today. Hopefully, we're gonna find some fish. There's a fish, little guy. I tell you, this is such a, an effective technique because you can literally pick apart every single micro seam that you see on these rivers and in these, in these pools. Um, the trick is though, which is really bizarre, is that you actually have to lead your flies, which means your rod tip is below the, the level of where your flies are. And on a tight line, you're looking and feeling for any kind of bump. Oops, there it goes. And, um, you know, you step in here, you can pick apart a, a pool and, um, you know, something that you may catch one or two fish with an indicator. I mean, you can really, really pick it apart and see some great success with this technique. What I'm doing here is I'm casting upstream with this double fly rig and on a tight line, I'm two handed fishing it down, leading with my rod tip so that I'm literally cutting through this water, managing my slack with my other hand. Lots of anglers do one hand, right? And they will raise it up, but not managing their slack, okay? With a two hand technique, you can place it, raise it up, find the bottom, and then fish it all the way down. Now, when you get a good drift, and we'll drift that you're happy with, you can actually lower your rod tip and swing it. And there's a fish right there, just like that. Little guy, but hey, if it fooled a little one, it's gonna fool a big one too. There we go, quick release. Little trout. This is such an effective technique for picking up fish. It's absolutely amazing. And the thing is, is that you know, we've been told when you're indicator fishing to always go with the speed of the bubbles. Let your, let your flies go with the speed of the currents. Well, this, you're actually looking for your flies to go two to three times slower than the, than the speed of the current. So that's why you're leading your flies, is that you're actually controlling the, the nymph as it bounces down, you know, that far off the bottom. Um, and it's right in the strike zone of, of rainbows. We've been catching little ones today, but they're big ones here for sure. Little pheasant tail, beadhead pheasant tail. A little pink in it. They're feisty. And when you're learning a new technique like I am with urine and thing, it is a great, great thing to be able to see success of any kind. Even if they're little, they still play. All right, well, I'm buttoning them. Send him on his way. We've got five pound tippet on here, so you gotta be careful and you gotta play the big ones when you get them. On a light line, hook just pops right out. This little guy gets to go and grow up. Amazing, so fun. I am a fan of this technique for sure. I just can't wait to get a big one. There we go. Another little trout, another little rainbow. So good. Ooh, they're active. <laughs> All right, let me run through the rod setup I've got here. 
This is an 11 foot three weight rod paired with a large rubber reel. It's got a Euro nymphing three weight line. It's super thin diameter. To that, we have attached our leader, which is 22 feet of monofilament followed by a small section of cider material with the tags left on. And then we have probably five and a half or six and a half um, feet of five pound tippet. To that, we have a fly hanging off of the tippet and then we're actually drop shotting this, uh, this pheasant tail, beadhead pheasant tail with uh, two pieces of BB. So that's the setup that we've got for catching these little trout. It's super fun. I'm brand new to urinifying and I'm here to tell you, I'll do it again for sure. There's so much to learn. Another little guy. Man, oh man. This is such an effective technique. I bet you dollars to donuts if I had come through here with a traditional indicator rig, a couple of nymphs, nymphs underneath, we would not have seen the fish that we've seen today. You know, we've jumped off a lot of fish that you know, probably my fault, but to be able to hone your skills catching wild fish, it's just incredible. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode of The New Fly Fisher. Thanks for watching. For more on our series, check us out at www.thenewflyfisher.com. My name is Mark Melnick. Remember, adventure is out there. All you need to do is go and find it. And what better way than to do it with a fly rod in your hand? From all of us here at The New Fly Fisher, thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll see you soon in the backcountry of Eastern Idaho, Yellowstone, Teton Territory. The New Fly Fisher is supported by Visit Idaho, Yellowstone, Teton Territory, Orvis Fly Fishing, Scientific Anglers, Trout Unlimited, WeatherTech Canada.